Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at CoVenture with David Freed, their Chief Technology Officer, who's going to explain what's going on at 7 nanometers and some of the problems that we're starting to run into, both at 7 and in looking out at 5 nanometers. David, there's a lot of confusing these days about node numbers. What are we really looking at here? Okay, so uh, a few generations ago, the, the node numbers stopped really having any relevance. Uh, it used to be, you know, lower metal half pitch, things like that, but uh, that even went away a couple generations ago. So uh, seven nanometers, most of the technologies out there have a gate pitch, maybe in the mid 50s, 54, 56, somewhere around there, and uh, a minimum metal pitch, 36, 40 nanometers, something like that. So the number seven really doesn't mean anything. Um, those are on average, the, the one-dimensional pitches uh, for gate and metal. But what's really starting to separate these technologies now are the two-dimensional rules, um, how much you can scale, cell height, um, and sort of tip-to-side, tip-to-you kind of patterning rules. So even if you specify the one-dimensional rules of gate pitch and minimum metal pitch, uh, these 2D rules can have significant differences or significant impacts in total chip area scaling. So what sort of problems are you starting to encounter at these latest nodes? At these nodes, at seven nanometer right now, uh, most of the problems really come down to patterning. I think the industry got over the, the FinFET hump in uh, you know, 22 or 16 or 14, those kind of nodes. Um, the foundry technologies really absorbed FinFET in those nodes. And there was a relatively evolutionary path to get to 10 nanometers. I mean, when FinFET was accepted, when everybody decided to go in that direction, it was because we could see the scaling path for a few nodes. FinFET was not going to be a one-node wonder. Uh, so there was a relatively evolutionary path to get to 10 nanometers. Uh, shrink it a bit, uh, improve the drive current a little bit, reduce the capacitance a little bit, clean up some of the things they wish they did in the previous technology, and 10 would, ha would exist. But 7 looks like it's the last evolutionary technology for FinFET. We have to shrink even more. What was self-aligned double patterning in a previous generation is now self-aligned quad patterning. Uh, there's a lot of very, very difficult aspects of shrinking uh, FinFET from 14 to 10, but now down to seven, it's really, really difficult for shrink, uh, both on the device and the dense interconnect in the lower levels. So is it really just a litho issue, or are there other things that have to be dealt with as well? Okay, so yes and yes. Um, it's not really just a litho issue to shrink anymore, because the shrink is being done with these very complex patterning schemes. It's, it's not just all on litho. So what we're seeing across the industry is some foundries are going to have all optical versions of 7 nanometer technology. Others are going to go right into EUV. Uh, some foundries are going to convert from optical to EUV during 7 nanometer and have multiple different 7 nanometer technologies. But when you talk about multi-patterning or the EUV insertion, it's not just about litho. There's complex schemes with multi-patterning that involve lots of depositions, etches, cleans. Um, and then even just talking about dimensions, uh, we have to talk about self-aligned patterning and cuts. So it, it's not just litho, it's all these other processes just to do the patterning. And then, a completely different category, if we could pattern at these dimensions, how do we make the devices work and the interconnect yield? There's some serious material challenges and process challenges getting materials in those dimensions. Okay, let's deal with these one at a time because we've got a whole litany of things here. What happens on the litho side? So we now have EUV coming into the market after many delays. People are starting to use it, but they're not using it for the direct patterning the way that they would be using the multi-patterning, right? Yeah, I think so. I, if, if EUV had been a generation or two earlier, we would have gone straight to single patterning EUV at a lot of these levels. But uh, because EUV has pushed out pretty late in the schedule, we've gotten very good at multi-patterning. We've gotten uh, really good at self-aligned double patterning and now in self-aligned quad patterning. The processes, the metrology, the manufacturing of these technologies has really gained strength. And so now at 7 nanometer, there's a lot of levels that will be self-aligned quad patterned. Uh, and when we migrate into EUV, it's not going to necessarily replace that. Why don't you draw this out for us? Okay, so if we're going to look at this top down, uh, the first step in a multi-patterning or a self-aligned quad patterning module 
is you pattern a mandrel or core level. Okay. Um, you then use a spacer technology to generate essentially a line on either side of this of the core. So you've now just turned one line into two lines. You remove the, the core. And then you do that exactly, that same process again, and you end up generating a line on either side of that spacer line. So what I've just done is I've done a single lithographic pass, and I've generated now, as you can see, four lines from a single lithographic pass, just using spacer depositions and etches. Uh, that's quad patterning. And that's wonderful. I've done one lithographic pass. I get four lines. The problem is logic technologies aren't just lines and spaces. We now have to use some patterning techniques to cut this up into the pattern we really want. And here's where it gets messy. In seven nanometer self-aligned quad patterning modules, usually there's three or four what are called cut levels. Um, if I need this line cut here, I have to put a cut mask here. Well, if the next line needs to be cut nearby, I can't do it on the same exposure. I end up putting an, a cut mask here to cut that. And usually the patterns are so dense it requires three or four different lithographic steps to do all the cuts. This is where a self-aligned quad patterning module actually really starts to get painful. I've done one lithographic step for the lines and spaces, but I have to do three full passes and sometimes a complex patterning module to cut it up. You want to take that one level further, if this is, say, a Metal 2 VIA 1 dual Damascene module, I have to do a similar type of lithographic technique for all the vias. Okay, so just drawing this out for Metal 2 plus VIA 1, I have one lithographic step to initiate the self-aligned quad patterning. This is the lines and spaces. I have three to four steps to do cuts, and I can have three to four steps to do vias. This is a single dual Damascene module, and this could be seven to nine levels, lithographically and with complex integration through the whole thing. So what does EUV do to this? Okay, so the, real way, pl the first place that EUV is gonna be inserted, in my view, is to knock out these multi-pass cuts and vias, okay? So if, if you go to EUV and you can turn this into a single exposure because these are now not so close that they break optical uh, resolution limits, and then the same for vias, you can do those in a single level. All of a sudden, we're now at three levels to do metal two and via one, uh, a single perhaps uh, 193 immersion level, two EUV levels to do cuts and vias, we've made a significant process reduction to get the same type of patterning. Now, I'm very careful when I talk about this because I think the first insertion of EUV will simply replace all the extra passes of cuts and vias, and it might not even be leveraged for uh, a density shrink or a ground rule shrink. It'll just be a, a significant process reduction as we've shown here. However, once this has been done, once you've accomplished this process change, it's not hard to start changing the ground rules on your cuts and vias and allowing the designers to go with a denser cut and via pattern and EUV will be leveraged in a second iteration in the same way, the same process sequence to get a chip area scaling benefit. And typically when we scale, it's always been a we solve one problem, then move on to the next problem. This is one of the big problems that's been sitting there and, and everybody's focused for a very long time, right? Yes. So everybody's been looking at this for a long time. Uh, honestly, EUV, if we had had EUV at 22 or 14, the implementation would have been very different. We would have planned, uh, planned for EUV, direct patterning, single patterning, scaled the ground rules for it, and gone for it. The fact that it's drifted out already into the multi-patterning era the implementation and the, the challenge and the transition is actually very different and, and really interesting. This implies that seven nanometers is going to be a very long node because we're going to have multiple iterations of this. So at first you're doing the vias and cuts with the, the EUV. The next version of this, you'll actually do some of the patterning with it, right? 
Well, so I think, and we've seen this in the press already, some foundries are announcing that their initial seven nanometer technology will be all optical. Some foundries are announcing straight into EUV. Um, what I think it will happen across the industry is there will be a real combination of strategies here. Well, maybe they'll start optical, begin implementing EUV just as cost reductions to knock out some processes and litho passes, and then later on there will be a, another iteration of seven nanometers where they'll start scaling dimensionally to get some density shrink. So you may see two, three, or even four different seven nanometer technologies come out of different foundries as they go through this transition. A as a result, I do think seven nanometer as a whole will be a very, very long node. It's gonna offer a lot of different uh, cost points, a lot of different performance points, a lot of different density points uh, for, for all the different customers. What happens on the drive current? We've been hearing a little bit about that where the drive current goes up. Do we get an economy of scale by pushing up the drive current? Okay, so obviously uh, drive current has a direct relationship to chip performance. As, as you drive the current of each individual transistor up, you can uh, reduce the delay of your logic data paths. So that's the first thing. If you reduce the delay, that's a performance advantage. Everybody wants that. But one of the things that's been seen over the past couple generations is as we can drive the current up, we actually get an area scaling benefit by depopulating the fins of a given circuit. Let me try to draw that out a little bit here. Uh, typically, there is a cell image that is a certain dimension. Um, you'll have fins running horizontally and gates running vertically. Okay, And you construct logic blocks from this. So inverters, NAND gates, NOR gates get constructed all from the same image. Now because you have a, a circuit library, they all basically have to have the same height so that you can do your design and stack these devices up. The number of fins you can fit in this track height is really setting the current drive of each individual column of transistors here. And so one of the big advantages, if you can drive the drive current up from generation N to generation N plus one, or the next node, 10 nanometer to seven nanometer, something like that, what you may be able to do is with the same transistor design, maybe I can get away with two fins um, for the NFET and the PFET in a given circuit where I could only, where I needed four in the previous generation and therefore my cell image can shrink in the number of tracks. So there's an actual scaling benefit because the pitch of these fins is reduced, the pitch of the gates is, is reduced. So there's purely dimensional patterning scaling benefit, but if I'm also able to depopulate the devices, meaning do with two fins what I needed four in the previous generation, I get an additional scaling benefit to the, to the cell height, the cell image, and that's a, that's a pretty big advantage in 2D area scaling for the fully integrated chip. So what comes next? Does the FinFed actually move beyond seven nanometers? Can we extend this? There's been a lot of debate about that. Okay, so I think seven nanometers is, is pushing fins pretty hard, pushing direct, you know, conventional FinFed technology very hard. Uh, it's my view, I think the view of many other people, that for the next real node, the next major node, we're going to need a, a further significant device innovation uh, to get the type of benefits we're looking for. So I think five nanometers, which would be the next major node, uh, that's going to have to have something that looks a little bit different than a fin. Maybe nanowires, nano sheets, vertical devices, something like that. Um, I think seven nanometers might be the end of the line for conventional looking fin fits. Why is that? Well, I think basically we, we've gotten to the point of um, electrostatic advantage from the fin, a double gate device, and being very thin. We've gotten to the point of leveraging that advantage for all the gate scaling we can get out of it, and now we have to leverage an additional type of electrostatic control. So gate all around has uh, further improved electrostatic control of the channel by having the gate on all sides, not just two. Uh, so gate all around is an example of an additional electrostatic advantage that will control the transistor better and allow further scaling. So what will it be like to work with some of these new transistor structures, whether we're in nanosheets or we're into gate all around FETs? From a device perspective, going from planar devices to FinFET was a, a really interesting challenge. These, we went from 
bulk planar, which is you know a sort of textbook transistor, to a fully depleted thin silicon double gate device. Uh, from a device engineering perspective, that changed a lot. Uh, there's no quasi-neutral region. There's no floating current in the floating body if you compare to a partially depleted SOI. So that was a, a real game changer. And now as you go to gate all around and have a circular device, that's a big change. So device engineers are going to have a really fun time as we go to nanowires or nano sheets. Um, from an integration perspective, there's huge challenges. Um, we're going to be performing processes like etch and depositions and cleans on regions that are not visible from the top of the wafer, that are underneath suspended structure. So unit process development, integration, they're going to have a lot of fun uh, working through this. I think if, if this is done correctly, the designer may be able to see a relatively seamless transition from FinFET to nanowires until we start stacking different type devices on top of each other in the nanowire uh, regime. Uh, if, if we're just doing FinFET to nanowire basic transition, we'll see uh, a relatively seamless circuit design transition there. Uh, the really interesting stuff is when you start seeing people talk about uh, CFET technology, which is different types of nanowires stacked on top of each other, you know, maybe putting an NFET and a PFET on top of each other in different, uh, different nanowires. Then the circuit designer is really going to have to get involved. So what does that look like? Okay, so if you take a cross-section of a FinFET, um, what we're seeing is most of the devices have a real tall fin, the gate wraps up and over them, you know, they get a little fatter as they go into the STI, right? So the fin looks like this, the gate wraps up and over it, it's a very thin body of silicon, current runs in and out of the board. Um, as this transitions, the initial transition to nanowire, uh, instead of having a tall fin with the gate, all, gate wrapping up and over it, it's really just going to convert to a couple of fins, or a couple of wires, like this, I'm sorry, one fin transition to a couple of wires. Again, current running in and out of the board. Now, if all three of these are uh, still NFETs or still PFETs together, the gate wrapping like this, then, then the circuit designer basically sees the same type of device. However, if we decide we can put an NFET here, a PFET here and here, all of a sudden we have a pair of devices or a, tr or a trio of individual transistors sitting in the same footprint. And now there's got to be a lot of changes to circuit design. This is to some extent what the 3D NAND guys have gone through, right? I think the 3D NAND technology has taught the rest of the semiconductor industry a big lesson. Um, 3D, uh, 2D NAND, they really hit the scaling limits before anybody else did. They were pushing harder and harder. They were in quad patterning before anybody else was. And they really hit some of these lithographic scaling limitations before the rest of the industry. And so what they did is they, they turned the device on its side they went three-dimensional, and that allowed them to step back from a lot of the lithographic challenges. So uh, many of the lithography uh, steps in 3D NAND are actually not very close to these limits that Logic and DRAM are at. Um, so I think the Logic business is looking at that and saying, well, how do we take planar designed Logic and turn that into 3D to get the same type of advantage uh, in design area scaling while we're maybe able to step back a little bit from the lithographic challenges. David Freed, thank you very much for a great explanation. All right, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed this.